How's everybody doing today? I love these Sunday mornings with you all. And uh, we got a pretty full house this morning. It's a great thing. So we're going to be continuing on in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. The uh, message title is Sown in Peace. And, uh, you know, peace is a, a elusive thing at times. Um, I know that we all go through a lot of trials and tribulations, particularly in the culture that we're living in right now. Um, I, I'm, so how's the gas prices? I, $6.10? $6. Are you kidding me? And uh, uh, I got a little perturbed, and I had to go to Costco where it was only five forty-five. That kind of made me a little happier. But there's a lot of stuff going on in this world right now that uh, is not very palatable. But when we have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it helps us to negotiate our pathways. It helps us to be a little more in tune with the atmosphere in this culture. And I don't, I don't think that, uh, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's going to get better. I'm not really so sure that it is going to get better. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're headed to a second coming, a new coming, uh, a, a, a part where we know that we're going to be jacked right up out of here and find ourselves suddenly in heaven when we hear that, that trumpet, when we hear that voice of the archangel. And it, it's coming soon. And it, it, it's going to be a marvelous time. And it's going to be followed by a time of darkness that has... What is that? That's the trumpet? I'm ready, man. I'm ready to go. So we're going to be starting in James chapter 3, verse 13, and it goes like this. Um, who is wise and understanding among you? Anybody? <laughs> Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. I love this because meekness is, a, is not a weakness. We, we, we have a tendency to associate uh, meekness with uh, inability to negotiate the trials and troubles of life. And like we're like little puppy dogs uh, laying at the master's feet, begging for help. And, uh, and, and that's not what meekness is about. What meekness is about is power under control. What meekness is about is having the strength of the Lord in us, but having the discernment and the wisdom to only utilize that power in grace. You know, I, I get, anybody get mad? Anybody get mad? That's the, that's the time when we need to be practicing that grace that, that is, is manifested of, of meekness. It's that time when we need to be humble and sweet and forgiving and loving you know, people, you know, Jesus said, you know, there's going to be offenses that are going to come our way. But what do we do with those offenses? And it's like I, I, I we can take those personally and, and, and develop a resentment. And I love that saying about resentment where it says it's like drinking poison, hoping somebody else to die. It, you know, it, I have no room in my life for resentments. And, and neither do you, frankly. But it goes on, it says... But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. It's saying, don't say that you don't. Don't say that you don't have, 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 have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, this wisdom that's self-imposed, this, this wisdom that says, yeah, I, I got it all together, man. I'm smart. I know exactly what I'm doing with every hour that the, that the Lord gives me. Uh, this wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, and I know this is Pastor, one of Pastor, Pastor Ben's favorite uh, sections of Scripture, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. 
who is wise and understanding among you? So we live in a world where, where it's absolutely full of people who think they are wise and they want you to think that they are wise as well. And there are literally thousands of talk radio stations hosted by people who want to spout off for hours about their positions on this or that, trying to convince you that their way is the right way, when in fact it's not. Thousands of columns and thousands of publications written by other people who want to share with us how wise they are about whatever their field of expertise might be. Every other post on Insta is some would-be philosopher who, who, who uh, 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 have five things you need to know about your wife's love language. I mean, every other post I see on Insta is some sort of philosophical advice about how to conduct your life, how to conduct your marriage. And, and none of these things really, uh, some of them are actually pretty darn good, but the ones that are, uh, are, are the ones that, that have good advice on Instagram or any other social media site that has something to say that actually makes any sense, uh, they, 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 they have biblical roots for the most part. They have biblical roots, it seems. And, and, and I will say that there are a lot of really smart people in the world who know a whole lot about a whole lot. But if it doesn't come from the Word of God, then it's, it's flawed. It's faulty. It's prone to failure. It's bound to let you down. The only real wisdom, the only real smart thinking comes straight from the Word of God. The, the truth is God's truth and only God's truth, and there is no other truth but the truth of the Word of God, right? And, and, and so uh, uh, what, what is the biblical view of wisdom? And it tells us in Psalm 110, 111, uh, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I, I spent years without the fear of the Lord, calling myself a Christian, but not really understanding the importance of holding him in the highest esteem, uh, the most, I mean, worshiping him with everything that I have. I failed in that arena many, many, many times. I think I'm getting closer to understanding that the, the, the word of God and, and, and the biblical view of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of truth, the beginning of the wisdom that we could possibly have in Jesus. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. That's continuing on in Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. The word tells us, and Jesus says, that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You won't be off chasing your own little pipe dreams, your own little ideas about what's, appro what's approved by God. We deep down inside know what God approves of and what God doesn't approve of. Uh, once again, comes back to obedience. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6, it says this. It says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands, that means to consider them a gift. God's commands are a gift that gives us life and sanity and sanctity and freedom. And it doesn't come from anywhere else. There is no other place that gives us the freedom that God's Word gives us, that God's Holy Spirit implanted into our hearts and our minds can give us. Right. It goes on to say, My son, if you receive my words and, and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Then you will understand. In other words, it's got to be the most important thing that we allow our minds and our hearts to consider or meditate upon or, 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 or look at and examine. You know, when we read the Scripture, man, we need to be examining what it says and how it applies to either our failure to follow or our ability to follow. And... and, and we will find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom. If you, receive my, if you receive my words and treasures, my command and my commands within you, that simply means that we take God's word to heart. 
we take God's word to heart. That's what we need to do. We need to put God's word first and foremost above every other thing in our lives. James also says that we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Yeah. How often do we uh, ride down the road listening to K-Wave in our car, listening to some uh, preacher, and, and, and we're taking those, those statements that he makes and, and, and we actually put them to practice in our lives? When we actually allow God's word to soak into us like a marinade on a good piece of meat, soaking it for a couple of days in a pan. I'm already thinking of lunch. <laughs> uh, but, but then like the, that meat, we, we get saturated and the flavor goes all the way through. Now if you take a piece of meat and just slop some barbecue sauce on it and, and throw it on that grill, well that hot fire is just going to burn that barbecue sauce right off and take a bunch of that good meat with it. Same thing is going to happen if you just think you are going to get by on a light brushing on of God's Word. No, it needs to be absorbed deeply. We need to take it into our hearts and our minds and acknowledge the authority and the truth and the rightness of it. Now, when you get out there in the fire, that is the Word, the world, I mean, if you get out there in that fire that is the world, if you don't have God's Word solidified in your heart, dwelling in your heart and in your mind, so that you have become dependent on the, the solidarity of God's Word, it, 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 when you get out there in that fire that is the world, if you're not doing these things, you are going to get burned. How many of you have been burned because you haven't been applying the Word of God like you know you should in your life. You made decisions that are causing you to error in great, in great ways. Like a good grill man can tell if the meat is well marinated, so can people tell if you are well marinated in the Word of God. People can see it on you. And Proverbs 2, 1 through 6 says this, My son... If you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. And the only kind of wisdom that is, that is worth anything is the wisdom that God gives to those who search for his heart as if for hidden treasures. Uh, you know, sometimes the world comes in and tempts us with things that are not necessarily wrong or sin, but are just not profitable in our walk in the way we want to live our lives and, and, and conduct ourselves, being the example of a Christian, a righteous Christian soldier, where uh, when people look at our lives and they go, wow, radically saved right there. Homie's radically saved. Verse 6 in 1 Kings chapter 3 says, the Lord gives wisdom. And it makes me think of Solomon. And if you turn with me to 1 Kings 3, verses 6 through 9, it goes like this. And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted therefore give to your servant this is amazing give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours God was stoked because Solomon didn't ask for anything for himself he asked for the wisdom to be a good servant and that's what we all got to do, whether it's for uh, the people at our work, for our children, for our friends, for our family. Just give me the 
authority over my own heart that I might discern between good and evil when it comes to managing the territory that you have given me and increase that territory that I might be faithful. God was stoked because Solomon didn't ask for anything for himself. He asked for the wisdom to be a good servant because that's what a good king is, as a servant. A good king is a servant. That's why any good leader is, is a servant. I don't care if he's the president of a motorcycle club or the pastor of a church. He needs to have the heart of a servant. We all need to have the heart of a servant. God's response to Solomon was in 1 Kings 3. Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall there be anyone arise like you after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. So James has asked this question. He said, he said, who is wise and understanding among you? He's asking that of us. Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, I've confessed to you and I will continue to confess to you that I've spent much time in foolishness, much time in foolishness, squandering the gifts that God has given me to satisfy my own personal desires. With, with great hope, I pray that I don't conduct myself in that manner anymore because what I truly want to be is a good pastor, a good husband, a good father, a good brother to those people on the street who don't yet know the Lord. I want to be generous and I want to be kind and I, and I want you to uh, seek those same gifts it would seem that the answer is those who are living in the word of the Lord and being obedient to his teaching. Those who are seeking out the heartbeat of the Lord are those who are going to receive the grace and the riches and the favor of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. The verse finishes by saying, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom and the meekness of wisdom. These are things that we can only acquire through beseeching the Lord, petitioning the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, make me a stand-up person. Make me a person who honors your word. Make me a person who carries uh, the lamp of your righteousness in my heart and in my mind, that I might not be corrected for foolishness, but I might be exalted as I glorify you for wisdom. It's not the talk, it's the walk. It's not the talk, it's the walk. And our works show where our hearts are invested. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do our attitudes and the motives that we carry within us match our actions? That's a question that, I, you know, we learn in, if you're involved in, in, in a recovery program, if you're, if you're working steps, you, you know that uh, you have to ask the question, do our attitudes and our motives match our actions? When I wake up in the morning, it's my motives to serve, to be that guy who will do for you in spite of whether I feel up to it or don't. I remember one time I came home from church, I had a new pair of boots on. You guys have probably heard this story before. I had a new pair of boots on. Uh, they were just, my feet were like, boom, boom, boom. I came home and I put my feet up on the coffee table, took my boots off, and the phone rings. And it was somebody that I'm not really uh, like that excited to talk to. Uh, uh, you know, you, think, you got those people. They're just kind of abrasive to you. You're just kind of like, oh, man. And, and Dawn picks up the phone and she goes, are you going to answer that? I'm like, I, I'm tired. I don't feel like it. I just want to kick back here with my feet on the coffee table as they throb incessantly. 
And she goes, answer the phone, Pete. And I'm like, ah, oh, do I have to? She's like, yeah, you have to. So I did. And it was somebody who wanted me to meet them at Starbucks. I, I started, you know, that was back when we started setting up at 6 a.m. And we didn't finish until 12, 12.30. And I'm like, dang it, I'm not really even that fond of this guy. It's like, you know, he's on my caller ID, and I saw, I'm like, oh. And, and Dawn said to me, she goes, go meet him at Starbucks. Said, Babe, I'm tired, man. My feet are killing me. I, I just need to rest. She goes, you'll have plenty of time to rest after you're dead. Get your stinking shoes on and go to Starbucks and meet this homie. I'm like, oh. So I did. And something happened in my heart. Something happened in my heart. And suddenly I found myself with my coffee and him with his coffee. And I, I found I was enjoying myself with this man. Which was a total surprise to me. <laughs> and we stayed there for over an hour. And I built a relationship that had previously not existed whatsoever with this person. And even now they're a dear, dear friend to me. Why? Because that woman set me straight and told me what I needed to do to serve the Lord and to honor what he'd done for me, right? And, um, and, and, and sometimes that's a hard thing to make a decision to put ourselves aside and help somebody that evidently really needs our help, right? Yesterday I was at a, a NA meeting and there's a guy who had spent 22 years in prison and he got out, oh, I don't know, six months ago. And he's doing, he's, he's doing really well. He got, he got a, a, a job and he got a place to live. And, you know, he's got himself cleaned up real nice. And, and then the day before yesterday, he relapsed on methamphetamine. And somebody came up to the meeting, me in the meeting and asked if I could give him a ride back to his hotel, um, the, uh, uh, what, the Motel 6 on Harbor and Gisler. And I, I'm like, sure, I'll take him. It's amazing how, how bad we can get in a 24-hour period. On the way to the motel, he pointed out 15, 17, 18 people that were following him. And I'm like, dude, nobody's following you. It's amazing how quickly we can fall into the hole of deceit from the devil. I told him, I said, uh, bro, that lady that you just pointed out in the white minivan that's following you, it's like 75 years old. <laughs> Every car was following us. And I'm like, you know, I've been there. I spent three days in a tree across the street from my house with a rifle. I was sure that somebody was climbing in through the bathroom window that was like this big. I know uh, many of you have seen the little people, but, but, but what, 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 what's missing there is an acknowledgement of who God is and what he wants to do in your life and believing a lie from Satan, believing a lie from Satan. And I, I, you know, how quickly we can get sucked into that, that place. So we have to ask ourselves, do our attitudes and motives match our actions? Are we willing to be of service? Are we, are we willing to love on somebody who, uh, for a temporary time, is absolutely unlovable? I'm like, dude, get out of my truck. But, but, I, but I, prayed, I prayed with him. And I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that today he picks a, so a day to be sober. But are we doing what we do for the kingdom or are we doing it for self-promotion? Am I helping people because, well, you know, it just gives me uh, brownie points in the community, makes me look good in the meeting. Yeah, I'm the guy that helped him, took him to his hotel, and ministered to him, prayed over him, and that. Aren't I bitching? No, no, I'm not. I'm prone to sin. I'm prone to failure. And it's not if, 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 
Well, I'm not asking this to, I'm not, I'm not asking these questions like, are we doing what we do for the kingdom of God or for self-promotion? I'm not doing these, this to be mean-spirited or to paint anyone in a bad light. But the thing is that I, I have earned being a pastor. The thing is that I, what I have learned being a pastor is that I have to constantly check my motives. I have to constantly check my motives. We are human, and we all have a tendency towards self-centered thinking. And pride and ego can sneak in the back door and blindside our work for the kingdom of God. And before we know it, we're looking for the approval of men. Before a lickety split, we're looking for the approval of men. And I have to continually go before God and ask like David asked in Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I take comfort uh, so often in, in, in that if David had these struggles, then we're probably in pretty good company, right? Questioning our sincerity, our honesty, our... But it's only a simple prayer away from being in perfect standing with God. It's like, Lord, forgive me for my humanness, and thank you for taking me off of that cross and hanging there yourself in a place that I deserve to be. I deserve to be crucified. I deserve to be judged. And yet, Jesus in his kindness and his compassion and his generosity took me off of that cross and allowed himself to be nailed up there. I take comfort that David had these struggles because it shows us the availability of God. When, when David was uh, uh, confronted by Nathan the prophet, uh, who confronted him about his uh, relationship with Bathsheba, and he quickly repented, and he was quickly forgiven. The next few verses, James gives us this contrast, James 3, 13 through 18 again. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthy, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Well, God didn't give us confusion. The enemy brought confusion into our lives by bringing forth doubt, bringing forth an uncertainty about where we stand in God. When God says, be sure, be sure that I'm for you, that no weapon formed against you will prosper that you are my son, and because of your faith in me, you have been given the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. That's a simple prayer, a simple move towards God that says, yeah, because of your belief in me and what I've done for you, you are my son. You are my daughter. Uh, uh, the words here, bitter envy, could also be translated as of something like piercing indignation. Bitter envy when we're angry at someone else's actions without really even having a reason why. While we fail to have the compassion and empathy that God calls us to have and has actually himself had for us. It, it reminds me of the Pharisees' attitude towards the teachings of Jesus. They had set up uh, such a system of legalism and judgment in the name of God that they had completely forgotten the heart of God. Rules and regulations, the law. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Listen now, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, or the law, kills, but the spirit gives life. Right? It's in the spirit where our life comes from. The law kills. The law is, is always judging you. They took the law of God, which was originally given to men, to show men that they needed an intimate relationship with God because they were unable to keep that law. They took the law and broke it down to the millionth parts and got so consumed trying to work for their salvation that they forgot to look up, forgot to look to the heavens forgot to keep their eyes on God. Jesus told those Pharisees in, in Matthew uh, 12, 33 to 36, either make the tree good 
and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, he's telling the Pharisees this, he's calling this, and John called them this also at, at Jesus' baptism. A, a brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So out of this piercing indignation that comes in when man is full of judgment rather than grace, uh, when we are trying desperately to see around the beam in our own eye because we are so sure there's a speck in our brother's eye, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm praying every day. I'm, I'm showing up at church. I'm serving. Uh, uh, but, but, but I still, uh, they got this beam in my own eye, but I'm not going to look at that because I know that, that, that there's a speck in your eye. I got to deal with your problems because I don't have any. I'm holy. I'm righteous. Baloney. That's brouhaha. Felonious brouhaha. I haven't seen much of this at first love. I have to say that this is the most wonderful church that I've ever seen. It really is. We show up here full of love, full of joy, full of uh, warm greetings and a desire for fellowship with each other. That's who we are. Jeremy and I were talking yesterday about how long we've been doing this together and how beautiful it has become. And we've been orphans. We've been We've been through it, man. We've been through a lot of stuff. We've been through some division. We've been through some backbiting. But guess what happened? The power of the Holy Spirit took over and gave us great, immeasurable grace. Great, immeasurable grace. I haven't seen a lot of division at First Love Church. There's been a little bit. God's done some pruning but he's done that pruning so that he could fill this church up with people whose hearts are desiring the fellowship that we have here. People whose hearts desire the truth and the righteousness of God in their lives. It's amazing. We have beautiful people here. And I'm so proud to be given the honor of being the pastor of this church. We have a very precious thing going here. And we need to do all that we can do to protect it, right? We can do that by making it an inside job. Each one of us needs to truly seek out this wisdom that comes from above that James is about to describe that. So in contrast with the last few verses, uh, it says, but, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. That means that it's unadulterated by foolishness. It's unadulterated by our own misrepresented opinions of things or people or situations. It is free from pride, ego, agenda, or man's opinion. Our opinion needs to be that it is all about the Word of God touching and working in the heart of man and preparing that man to live out what the Word of God has to say through love. And I like that. Live out the Word of God through love. Live out the Word of God through love. I don't harbor resentment. I don't harbor anger. If I got a problem with somebody, I'm quick to say, let's settle this. Let's hug it out. Let's pray. Let's support each other. You got problems? Tell me. I'll help you. That's who we are. That's who we need to be. That's who God has made us to be. And because and if the wisdom that is from above is pure and is received in its pure form, not sugar-coated, not, uh, not, not cut down into some kind of thing that's a, a result of our beliefs that are apart from the Word of God, my, this is what I think. Here's what I think you should be doing, Julio. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, if the wisdom that is from above is pure and it's received in its pure form, not, not coated with some other kind of thing, not used out of context to support someone's ideas, 
but given as it comes from the word. James 3, 17, 18, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. If we're seeking this wisdom that God gives and we are applying it to our lives and our interactions with others are the same way God has shared his grace with us, we will be right in the middle of God's will. We will be right in the middle of God's will. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And in verse 17 and 18, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And if we're seeking this wisdom that God gives and we are applying it to our lives and our interactions with others, uh, uh, we're treating the same way. And God has shared his grace with us, then we will be right in the middle of God's perfect will. And that's where we want to be, right? Right in the middle of God's perfect will. Not some adulterated thing that's uh, been polluted by the ideas or the thinking or the pride and ego of man. But in the middle of his perfect will. Because the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, what, a, what an unmatched God you are. There is no thing under heaven or on earth that can even come close to changing the heart of man into resembling the heart of God, resembling the heart of our Savior. And so I pray right now that every heart that's in this room gets cleansed and washed clean and brought into a place of humility and giving love, honor, and respect for our brothers and sisters as for you. We thank you. And if you're here this morning and you know you need to re-up, you know that maybe your, your walk with God, it, it needs a little tune-up. It needs a little injection of grace and mercy. Then I want you to pray with me right now. And so just pray after me. Dear Lord, I love you. And I know sometimes I fall short. But Lord, I don't want to and I want to be... I just want to re-up in your righteousness, Lord God. I just want to re-up in understanding your grace and to be walking in that grace and in that mercy. Lord God, that I would be a lover of men, a lover of women, a lover of people who have made in the similitude of you, Lord God. Uh, and God said, let us go down and create men in our own image. Help us to adhere to that image that we've been created in, Lord God, with a, with, with a grip with a grip that can't be matched, a grip of power, a grip of love, a grip of understanding. Help us, Lord God, to be who you have designed us to be. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.